One of the most intriguing questions that science has been looking at for over 100 years is how did life begin on Earth? Well, there are many different theories. Each one is quite possible, and we have to look at them and say, until we figure out one over the other, let's consider all of them. Number one is the belief that life actually came from outer space. Well, I have to tell you this very simply. If people think that DNA came from outer space and there was no life here, and that DNA created life, well, this is totally a false situation for a simple reason. DNA can only operate in the presence of a cell. The analogy is simply this. Perhaps uh, they sent a, uh, a memory stick with information to the Earth before there was a computer. Like, so, so what? You have this memory stick. What can you do with it? You don't have a computer. You can't use it. So the parallel is this. You can send DNA to the planet, but if there are no cells that know how to use it, the DNA is absolutely useless. So life may have gotten here already preformed, such as bacteria coming through asteroids uh, and meteors. That's a possible uh, source right there. It's also been suggested that the uh, ether and space around forming planets also contain uh, organic molecules that essentially rained on the surface of the planet during its formation. That's possible as well. Now, these are scenarios that we could think are real, but let's consider another one. Uh, and actually, back in the 1950s, a scientist by the name of Yuri uh, showed a very interesting experiment. He took the, uh, the elements that were presumed to exist before life was present on a planet, put them in a bottle, and then used lightning, uh, electrical sparks, through that solution. And guess what? All of a sudden, out of the basic elements in that solution, uh, amino acids formed, building blocks of nucleic acid formed, and the building blocks of sugars and fats formed automatically from what? Just the electric atmosphere and the primal elements on Earth. So the simplest understanding right now uh, is that life could form all by itself uh, because the uh, atmosphere and the elements of the planet interacted and created pools uh, where fundamental molecules such as basic proteins and nucleic acids and fats were automatically created through electrical activity and the primal elements. Well, did life just begin in a pool? They call it the primeval pool or the primeval pond. Uh, uh, the idea that a whole bunch of proteins and stuff were just floating in there and they represented life. And the answer is no. You can't have life like that. The proteins that provide for the structure and the function of our human body, proteins have to be in a very precise environment in order to work. So in other words, you have to control the temperature, the pH, and the salt balance of a solution to make an exact environment by which proteins can work. And I say, well, that can't happen in a pond or a pool for a very simple reason, because the environment is continuously changing. So how can you have life in a pool where the salt balance or the pH or whatever else is going on there is continuously changing? Uh, you can't, because you need regulation and control. So the interesting aspect about this is that before life could be created, the first thing that had to be created was a membrane. And the membrane was important because it isolated the proteins in a private environments separate from the rest of the world around it. So once inside a membrane-bound structure, the interior contents can be controlled for temperature, pH, and salt balance. And this is how you can then put proteins in an environment and control them. You say, well, how did the membrane form? Uh, and this is also very interesting and very exciting when you understand it. Uh, the idea is this. The basic molecules of a membrane are phospholipids, and they form spontaneously in the early Earth environment. And the significance is if you can shake a bunch of phospholipids up in a bottle, you know what they do? They create structures that look just like bacterial cells. So in this picture that you can see right here, uh, what appears to be bacteria are not living cells at all. That's just shake, shaking phospholipids in a bottle and then observing what happened, the phospholipids spontaneously assemble into cell-like structures. So the first step of creating cell didn't require any special magic or anything. All you had to do is to have phospholipids in the solution, and they would self-assemble into a membrane. Well, now that I've isolated proteins inside a membrane in my primeval soup, uh, how did life work? Well, first of all, you needed energy. 
And so I said, well, where does energy come from? Well, energy comes from the environment. Energy in the form of sunlight, of course, is the primary source of energy that creates life today. But we also know that organisms living near volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean, where the temperature of the water is near boiling, there are living organisms. I said, well, where do they get their energy? There's no sunlight down there. And the answer is, the chemical reactions that occur in the heat of a volcano can also generate the chemistry of life. So life can be generated from uh, the environment through heat and chemistry, or life can be created through photons uh, coming from the sun. So how do you create life? Well, A, you assemble the membrane spontaneously. B, you put proteins inside as the membrane is forming. And C, you need to get the energy into the protocell. And what is a protocell? Well, it's not a real living organism, but it has the building blocks and the molecules of a living organism. And so I said, well, how does a, a, a protocell get energy? Uh, and there's a great suggestion from Harold Morowitz, an evolutionary biologist, that is when those membranes are forming from the uh, phospholipids, forming spontaneously, sometimes little pieces of mineral crystals very, very small. You can't see them with your eyes. Uh, imagine uh, a quartz crystal this big and then shrink it down to a small little molecule, uh, really small. It's still a quartz crystal. I say, well, what does that mean? I say, it has been recognized that um, crystal elements get trapped into the membrane. I say, so what? Well, these crystal elements, just like big crystals, when sunlight goes through a crystal, it breaks it up into the energy spectrum, the rainbow, and that these frequencies that come from the white light can uh, energize the developing organism that, that's not a, yet a cell, it's called a protocell, uh, and that energy can be trapped inside the membrane as light shines from the sun onto the surface of the protocell, and there are crystal elements in that membrane, light hitting the crystal is broken into energy that can be used to uh, provide for the protocell. So the source of life came from environmental energy sources outside of the membrane and transmitted through. And then these energy molecules can be used to help proteins change their shape and create behavior and function. But it's not still a living cell yet. And the reason is, is that whatever combinations are in there may not be the combinations that collectively will create life. So it took a period of time in evolution for the right molecules to end up inside the protocell that these molecules can engage with each other uh, in metabolic activity and be coordinated. And the coordination, of course, is due to the signals coming from the environment that pass through the membrane. So the membrane is the first structure uh, of biological life. The membrane acts as a barrier to control the interior environment, but the membrane also has proteins built into it that engage in the activity of reading signals from the environment and then sending signals inside the cell to control the proteins. So, how did life form? Could have formed spontaneously. Just by being on the earth with the energy sources from the heat of volcanoes or from the sunlight, these energy sources engaging with uh, pre-cell structures called protocells that are surrounded by membranes that spontaneously form. So you can say, yes, life came from another planet, but it's just as easy life could have formed from uh, the uh, materials right on this planet. So the most primitive cell actually looks like uh, uh, the cell's membranes that are formed when you just shake up phospholipids, a bacterium, and these phospholipid membranes have the same shape and the same size. So it's not uh, unusual to see that bacteria and, and the spontaneous forming lipids of, of the uh, phospholipids, the spontaneous forming membrane, that, uh, that the bacteria and the spontaneous uh, membrane formations are exactly the same size. Uh, and so what is it? It's like, well, the primitive protocell-like structure finally accumulates enough proteins that can engage and carry out the functions of life, uh, taking in energy, making movements, uh, reproducing itself. Uh, these are characteristics of life. So the first elements that were alive 
are called prokaryotes. And this is before there were any organelles in the cell. It's just an outer membrane with cytoplasmic support. Uh, and the cytoplasmic support is involved with uh, creating the new proteins and adjusting the pH and the temperature, et cetera. So what do we have is a membrane with support material on the inside that will become the future cytoplasm. I go, and where are the functions coming from? Digestion, respiration, excretion, uh, nervous system, intelligence, communication. Uh, wh where are these functions in a prokaryote, uh, a, a cell like a bacterium with no organelles in it? And the answer is this, the membrane is carrying out all of the functions. The membrane does digestion, the membrane does respiration, the membrane is engaged with cell motility, uh, the membrane is the nervous system. And I say, wow, so in a very primitive organism, all the functions are essentially just in the membrane of the cell. But through evolution, individual bacteria started to come together in a community. Meaning this, a bacteria in that small little size that it is, has a chromosome, which is a hereditary program, to create a bacterium. But it's just big enough to provide for the bacterium. But bacteria can learn. Ooh, they can learn. And how does that? Well, the membrane reads the environment, and then the membrane can uh, change the structure of the proteins in the membrane. A simple example is this. Penicillin is toxic to bacteria. So if I have a whole test tube filled with bacteria and I add penicillin, almost all of the bacterial cells are going to die. But guess what? Some of the bacterial cells create receptors that bind that a penicillin molecule. First, they just hold on to the penicillin molecule, but with some tweaking or changing of the structure of those uh, proteins, they can turn into enzymes, proteins that break down molecules. So uh, a molecule that's created to, to recognize penicillin at first is a receptor, but if you modify it, it can be an enzyme that when it captures penicillin, it breaks it down. Ah, this is then how bacteria learn to adapt to environments that might be toxic. That's why you can put bacteria into an oil spill and wait a little bit, and guess what? There'll be bacteria that eat the oil. You can create any environment, stick bacteria in it, and after a short period of time, the bacteria will change the structure of its proteins, not just to recognize the signals in the environment, but to engage with those signals, such as creating enzymes to break the signals down, or enzymes to bring signals together and create metabolism. But cells have a very limited ability to learn new things, uh, these bacterial cells. Uh, and I say, well, what is a new learning? Well, if I learn how to make a receptor that becomes an enzyme to break down penicillin, which can save my life, I need to reproduce that, so I have to have a gene. But I already have a chromosome uh, for the bacterium before I created the uh, protein that will destroy the penicillin. So when a bacterium learns something new, the new gene doesn't go into the chromosome. The new gene stays as just a ring of DNA. And this ring of DNA uh, it codes for that very specific new protein. So uh, a, a bacterium can learn about oh, maybe up to about 10 different things. In other words, create 10 of these little rings of DNA. And uh, they're separate from the chromosome, but they reproduce and create the proteins that the cell's going to use. Simple point is this. A chromosome makes the protein, and the rings of DNA, they create uh, the new proteins that the bacterium learned over time. Uh, a protein uh, can be made through these little rings of uh, DNA, and yet, remember, they're not connected to the chromosome. So when you look inside a bacterium, you have the chromosome, which builds the bacterium, and up to about 10 of different kinds of little rings of DNA that can code for new proteins that are not in the chromosome. But then I say, guess what? A conventional bacterium can only learn about 10 things. Uh, and I say, yeah, but the world might need you to learn 15 things or 20 things to stay alive. I say, well, how's a bacterium going to stay alive in a world where it already learned all the things it can learn because it can't hold too many of these rings of DNA and work with them? So all of a sudden, guess what? To stay alive, bacteria had to live in a community. Yeah, 
Let's say I'm a bacterium and I just learned how to make a protein that will capture penicillin and I can turn it into an enzyme, break the penicillin down, and actually use the penicillin as food. But you're a bacterium and you don't have that capability. You don't have that enzyme. I say, well, all of a sudden, let's say penicillin comes into our world. Well, I can protect myself because I have the new enzyme and the ring of DNA that makes that enzyme to protect myself. But you, if you don't have that DNA ring, you could die. So I said, well, wait a minute. Bacteria learned how to transmit these rings of DNA. So they create little finger-like extensions. So when two bacteria come together through these little fingers called pili, they can take the DNA from one bacterium and put it into the other bacterium. We can share information. Ah, so all of a sudden it says, if I learn something new that can save our lives as a bacterium, and I make a new ring of DNA to code for that protein, I can then transmit that protein to the community, and they can use it as well. So all of a sudden it says, bacteria in a community? I go, yes. Bacteria, you think, are just free living. Here's a bacterium, there's a bacterium. It's like, no, they're always in community. Bacteria trade information back and forth. As I said, these little finger-like projections called pili, when they touch between two bacteria, can cause the DNA of one bacteria to move into the other bacterium and translate or transmit that knowledge. So when bacteria live in a community, they're smarter than bacteria that live alone. Why? Well, if I have X amount of smartness and you have X amount of smartness, well, that's 2X smartness. That means twice as smart. If we can share our information, then both of us are twice as smart as a bacterium living alone. So the more bacteria that come together and share their information, the stronger the community because of the capabilities. More genetic information, more proteins, more functions. So in the early stages, Bacteria were like free on their own, but they communicated with each other via the pili is one way. Another way is actually viruses. Viruses are actually communications between bacteria. So a virus from bacteria A can move over and go into bacteria B so that bacterium A can change the, the, the life of bacteria B by sending a DNA code. And this is what viruses are for. They weren't negative to begin with. Viruses were very positive. That was a way of communicating with each other if you're not touching each other. I can leave the virus in the solution, and then you moving along, oh, here's a virus, pick it up, and now you have new education. So bacteria started to live in community where they can exchange information. And they started to put a membrane around themselves. Because why? Well, any living organism, including us, has to have a, an environment that protects us. And, and you know, like if, if, in wintertime or summertime when the temperatures are to totally different, uh, life, if it's connected to the temperature, will change from the winter to the summer. But if life is inside a membrane and I can keep the temperature constant, then the biology is the same all year round. It's not affected by the temperature on the outside. So when bacteria came together in a community, they surrounded themselves with a big membrane, like a family inside a big membrane ring. And this membrane saved the environment and kept it constant so the community of bacteria could engage and share information and each bacterium could do a different job. And that's how it started out. And these clusters of bacteria, before uh, 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 amoebas were formed, Clusters of bacteria came together in a community, surrounding themselves with a membrane, and they're called biofilms. Biofilms are uh, locked communities with a whole bunch of different kinds of bacteria living under the same membrane, like a community sharing information with each other. So as the world was moving around them, the community of bacteria could adjust each other and adjust the community to stay alive in a world that was ever-changing. Well, biofilms were the second form of life. First form of life were just individual bacteria. And they were in community, but they were floating by each other. They weren't all stuck together. And as I said, as they float by, they can transmit information with the pili, or uh, as the bacterium is moving through their world, they can pick up viruses and share information. So they started out as communities with cells very, very spread apart. 
But at some point, it was more efficient to bring all the bacteria together into communities with hundreds of bacteria surrounded by a membrane. And in those communities, some bacteria uh, did respiration. Some bacteria did digestion. Other bacteria eliminated waste. And all of a sudden, you say, oh, the bacteria became an integrated community. Not all bacteria did the same thing. In a biofilm community, different bacteria had different functions. I go, well, then what happened? Well, it got specialized. In other words, instead of having 100 different bacteria, what if the bacteria uh, used their chromosomes and that rings, their rings of DNA and collected them in one bacterium? So one bacterium is now p picking up the DNA and the information from all the other bacteria, and it forms a big structure, which we now call the nucleus of a cell. In that nucleus is all the information provided by all the different bacteria, sharing that information in a former bacterium that has now become a, a nucleus inside a cell. Some of the bacteria stayed exactly the same. And these are the structures that become mitochondria. Mitochondria are parts of the original bacterial community that didn't lose their structure uh, because their structure was so important to the function that the bacteria that become mitochondria uh, couldn't change. They had to be essentially the same as they were when they first started. And so mitochondria, for example, derived from bacteria. Remember, bacteria have genes that many of the genes to make the bacterium end up in that nucleus, the, the, the cell, the bacterium that collected all the DNA. Uh, about 8 to 10 percent of the genes necessary for a mitochondria are still in the mitochondria. The other 90 to 92 percent of the genes for mitochondria are now collected in the main structure called the nucleus, okay? But all the other organelles that are membrane functions, there's the endoplasmic reticulum, which is making uh, proteins and fats. There's the uh, Golgi body, which is involved with transporting proteins out to the outside and synthesizing the fats into bigger molecules. There's the nucleus, which is actually the receptor of all the DNA from all the different bacteria in the biofilm. That becomes the nucleus. Uh, different structures are, are resulting in, into a new structure called organelle. So bacteria that do digestion create membranes that do digestion. Not the bacterium anymore. I don't need the whole bacterium. Why? I put the DNA into that one cell, that one nucleus uh, uh, that used to be a, pro, uh, a bacterium and absorbing the DNA has all the information in it that can create the functions of all the other, DNA, pr uh, other uh, bacteria in the community. So point, each bacterium has certain functions. They can come together in a community, surround themselves with a membrane, and this is called a biofilm. And the bacteria exchange information and work with each other so that they live in harmony in a community. But that wasn't efficient. So over time, the genes that are present in each bacterium that do a function, they all started to get collected into one big bacterium, which becomes the nucleus. And as a result, I don't need the individual bacteria anymore because now the nucleus contains all the genes to make all the functions that different bacteria were doing. And all of a sudden I say, well, then the structure of a biofilm changes. I go, yeah, when you, a biofilm, when you look at it, you can see all the individual bacteria all clustered around, moving around, living in harmony. But then I say, what did it do? It evolved. It made it more efficient. It got rid of all the individual bacteria, but kept the genes and, uh, and the nuclei from all the bacteria in, into what is now becoming the nucleus of a new cell form called an amoeba. An amoeba is the evolution of a biofilm. It, it's one cell, but the DNA in it came from all the different bacterial cells put together, and so the nucleus in the amoeba can create the proteins and functions that a whole biofilm had with just one, one uh, nucleus. And this is when prokaryote cells, and these are cells without organelles and without nuclei, uh, evolved into eukaryote cells. A eukaryote cell is a cell with a true nucleus in it that has all the DNA necessary to create all the functions so that one cell can do all the functions that a community of bacteria did in a biofilm. So from 
a single bacterium, became a community of bacteria, then the community of bacteria formed a biofilm, and then the biofilm evolved into an amoeba, and that was like a single organism. But remember, remember it came from the coalition, the coming together of all individual bacteria coming together into one organism. So the new organism is called the eukaryote. It's the kind of cell that we talk about, such as an amoeba. And I say, then what? Well, the amoeba started to uh, go out into the world, and it was very efficient compared to the community of bacteria called a biofilm. A biofilm is, is just a sack of bacteria living in harmony, but an amoeba is an individual cell that can move all around by itself. So it's not just a sack of bacteria. It is a motile, movable cell that can move around, and as it divides, creates more amoebas. And I say, well, what happened? Well, those amoebas started to uh, uh, operate independently, but they also had to live in a community. Again, while an amoeba can make more DNA and more proteins than any bacterium can, uh, we can make lots of them, uh, amoebas reached a limit of how smart they could be. And the reason is this. The membrane of the cell is the nervous system. Well, in a bacterium, the membrane is limited. You can only put so much membrane inside the bacterial capsule, so that's why a bacterium couldn't evolve too much. Why? If the membrane's a nervous system and a bacterium has a capsule on the outside like a shell, then guess what? You can only put so much membrane in it. So the nervous system of an individual bacterium could only get so big and then stop. It, couldn't, it didn't have enough membrane to make more. That's why they came together in community. They could share membranes. So if I have a whole community of bacteria, they can use their membrane functions individually, but then connect their functions by sharing the environment, the biofilm. But when the amoeba formed, it didn't have an outside shell anymore. It had a flexible membrane. It was like a balloon, and it could grow bigger and bigger. And the bigger the amoeba became, the more membrane it had. And the more membrane it had, the more intelligent it was because the membrane is nervous system. Can the amoeba get to be our size? Is, is there an amoeba the size of a human that would be really smart? I go, no, no. Here's the problem. When the amoeba is bu building more and more membrane, the amoeba gets bigger and bigger. I go, yeah, but guess what? Consider a balloon. We fill the balloon with a little bit of water, and we could throw the balloon around the room all day long. But if you fill the balloon with too much water and it gets too big, and then you try and throw the balloon, what do you think will happen? The membrane will break and the water will leak out. I say, ah, that's exactly what happened with cells. An amoeba can make itself bigger and bigger and bigger by expanding the membrane, but if it expands it too much, the membrane is fragile, and as the amoeba is in the environment, even the currents of the water could cause the membrane to rip, and the contents of the cytoplasm leak out, and the cell is dead. What does that mean? The amoeba only got to a certain size, because if it got bigger than that certain size, it would die. So there's only so much membrane that an amoeba can have. And I say, yeah, but evolution is more intelligent. I say, yeah, but I can only make an amoeba so big, just like the bacterium. I can only make the membrane in a bacterium so big because of the capsule. I can only make the membrane so big in an amoeba because if it gets too much bigger, it ruptures and then the cell's dead. So I say, wait, how's the sequence of evolution? And here's how it goes. First, there were protocells. And then in the cytoplasm of those developing protocells, there were enough proteins present to provide for metabolism and movement and reproduction. And that's when the protocells turned into a bacterial cell. And the bacterial cell, all the functions are in the membrane, but the bacterium, because of an outside capsule, an outside skeleton, can only make so much membrane. That meant I can't make a smarter bacterium <laughs> than, the, than how much membrane I could put in it. If I can't put any more in, then evolution stopped. I go, it stopped in making the smartest bacterium. But once the smartest bacterium was created, guess what? The bacteria came together in community and sharing awareness gave us a biofilm with much more intelligence and capability than any individual bacterium. And then I say, then what happened? I said, well, the biofilm with all the bacteria, it worked, but it wasn't very efficient. 
what happened to make it efficiency is that the bacteria in the community all shared their DNA so that instead of making hundreds of bacteria, one nucleus with all the DNA can do all of the functions that the different bacteria were doing. And this created a new cell called the amoeba, the eukaryotic cell with a nucleus that has all the programs. And I say, oh, then what? I say, well, now we want to make the smartest amoeba. And I say, how do you make smart amoeba? I say, more membrane, more membrane. And then I say, and how smart can I make it? I say, once the membrane's too big, you can't, uh, the, the cell will break and then it's dead. So you can only make so much membrane. And then I say, well, then what happened? I say, well, uh, as the amoeba formed, the next part was to make the smartest membranes in a single cell that I could make. But then just like the bacterium, there's a point where you can't add any more membrane. And evolution stopped again. I go, no, it didn't really stop. What happened was the amoebas came together in communities. And I said, well, what are communities of amoebas? I go, all the plants and all the animals, including us humans, are communities of amoebas. And we have 50 trillion amoebas making up our body. That's a very big community. But guess what? Well, all the cells assembled into the shape of a human body, the human body represents a new organism. And then what happened? Well, when humans formed, the next part of their evolution was make the smartest human you could make. Make the brain as big as you can. And guess what? The skull of a human is like the capsule in a bacterium. What's the point? I can only put so much brain into this nucleus in here, my head. I say, what is that important? I say, I can make the smartest human and pack the most brain inside the skull, but once I packed up the skull, I can't add any more new uh, brain material. (gasps) The evolution got a human as smart as it could get. And then guess what? Just like the bacterium, it couldn't add any more membrane. Just like the amoeba, it couldn't add any more membrane, and the membrane is the brain. The human got to the point where it couldn't add any more membrane, brain, and it stopped too. And I say, and what did it do? The exact same thing that every other time evolution reached this point, it did the same thing. It took individuals and then brought them into communities to share awareness. And this is where human civilization is today. We are the equivalent of very smart cells, but we can only be as smart as the amount of brain we have in here. What if you bring a thousand people together? What if you bring a hundred thousand people? What if you bring a million people together? It's just like bringing those bacteria together in a biofilm. We can share awareness. It is the sharing of awareness among humans that has created the technology that we see in our world today. Everything from telephones to rocket ships is not the result of any single human. It's the result of communities of human sharing awareness. And what we're seeing on the planet right now is an evolution because communities of humans have been separated into countries with borders around them like their own membranes. And yet, to reveal the full intelligence of humans, we must break all the borders. Why? We're all cells in a new thing called humanity. We are cells in the body of something bigger, humanity. And and so we are moving from individual human cells into communities of humans, which will lead to a one giant community where all humans on earth are cells in the body of a super organism called humanity. And this is the direction of our evolution at this very moment. When you see the world falling apart around you, it's, it's actually the necessary stage to move to the next level of evolution. How can we all become one when we're separated by borders of countries, when we're separated by religious beliefs? Uh, this is very difficult to make harmony. And so as you look at the world right now, guess what's happening? The structure is falling apart so we can build a structure with much more opportunity to evolve. And this is how we went from bacteria to amoebas to humans. And we're in the process of creating the new organism, humanity. So when you look at the world coming apart, that's a very positive sign. Why? Because we can't evolve as separate entities. The only way we're going to evolve is to come together in the giant community, a civilization where each human is a cell in the body of the new superorganism, humanity. (music) 
In our study on cells, we looked inside under the cell membrane and found that there are organized structures called organelles that carry out the basic functions of life, respiration, digestion, nervous system, etc. But interestingly enough, in plants and in animals, there are other organelles in there that are relatively different from what we have in our human body, but are primarily important for life on this planet. In plants, there are structures uh, called chlorophyll molecules. And chlorophyll molecules are molecules that can take sunlight energy and combine it with water and carbon dioxide and create the building blocks of life. So plants create their own building blocks, uh, their molecules that make up their cells, by using the energy of photons from light and then using those photons to uh, engage the uh, synthesis of organic molecules from carbon dioxide and water. And this is how plants can generate their own food just by being in the sunlight. Well, it's interesting because humans and animals don't have chlorophyll uh, molecules in their body. No, there's no structure like that. We, we're not using sunlight to create energy. But guess what? They found that another organelle called melanin granules of pigment. Melanin is pigment. Uh, and they thought the pigment at first was just simply uh, molecules to absorb the sunlight. So the UV light that comes from the sun that gives us sunburn, uh, the UV light will be trapped by the pigment and so it will not hurt the body. So the function that scientists first said about melanin is that, oh, it's a filter to block the UV light from creating mutations and burning up the cell, and, and that was all its function. But as people started to look, there were some questions. I said, wait a minute, pigment molecules, melanin, well, they're in everybody's skin, except if you're an albino, everyone has melanin in their skin. But they also found there was melanin inside the brain. There's a structure so filled with melanin, it's called the substantia nigra, meaning the black substance. And all of a sudden, the question is, what would be the use of pigment inside the brain? There's no sunlight there. Uh, and so it was a very curious question. Why should there be melanin on the inside? Well, back in 1983, 25 years ago, a colleague of mine by the name of Frank Barr dedicated a whole issue of a journal called Medical Hypotheses uh, to the subject of melanin, the function of these granules or pigment granules that we found in the body. It said the function is far greater than anybody had ever thought before. It's more than just to block the UV light from burning up our body. But there's a lot of activity associated with it, a lot of electrical activity, a lot of energy activities. And melanin then started to be recognized as a crystalline structure, crystal that can absorb light and alter the energy. And it turns out even more so, here's an exciting piece of information that will give you an idea of what melanin can do. In Chernobyl, after the nuclear explosion in the plant, uh, no one was allowed to go into the nuclear reactor area. But scientists want to know what's going on in there, so they have a little robot device drive through the nuclear reactor with a camera on it so people can see what's going on inside the reactor area. Well, what they found after a while was there was black mold growing on all the pipes and on the wall. The same kind of black mold that you have in your shower. Uh, if you have a shower curtain and you see the blackness on the edge of the shower curtain, uh, that's the same stuff. It's a fungus. It's black. Uh, and the idea, well, first of all, was this. How could anything be living in a reactor with all that radioactivity? When they started to study it, guess what they found? It was the black pigment in this fungus was converting radioactive energy into biological energy. So all of a sudden it says, oh my God, pigment molecules, the same as we have in our skin, were allowing cells to live in a reactor because the molecules of melanin were transforming the radioactivity energy into biological energy used for growth. That's how these organisms were growing. They were using radioactivity as for fuel. And you go, wow, Melanin does more than, you know, just the concept of absorbing light. It is a transformer of energy. 
The melanin in our body could take energy of different kinds, photon, light energy, electromagnetic field energy, radioactivity energy, and the melanin can transform those energies into something we can use in our body. And once we started to recognize this, that, oh my goodness, melanin is more than just a pigment to block the sun. It's carrying out a lot of electrical activity, especially when you start to recognize its role in the eyes. The entire retina of the eye uh, is, has a lining of melanin pigment. At first they said that was just to absorb the light. Well, it does absorb light, but it also transmits energy as well. And now the idea of melanin is somewhat like a parallel to chlorophyll, which are called chloroplasts in the cell. And so melanin pigment and chloroplasts are both devices, the melanin in animal cells, the chloroplast in plant cells, is to trap environmental energy and use that energy to generate life. And this is why many, many people called breatharians actually can live eating virtually nothing at all. Breatharians live on a minimal, and some say no food, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but they certainly don't live on the kind of diet we live on. The melanin in these people are trapping the energy from the environment, electromagnetic waves and electromagnetic energies, including photons as well, and using that energy to create metabolism. So breatharians are very, very healthy people, and lots of energy, but they don't get it through eating food. They get it like a plant from downloading the energy around them. So we're going to have to revise our understanding about the role of melanin. It is a vital functioning product of a cell that is used to translate environmental energy into useful biological activity. And once we start to see that, then the role of melanin in the entire body takes on a whole different meaning. Just right off, it simply says this, if melanin can take in radioactive energy and make biofuel out of it, can a human do this? Just the fungus? No, the human has the same pigment in it. So it is very likely, if it wasn't for the fear that we have, that the melanin pigment in our skin could actually lead us into a place where we can transmute what we think is toxic radioactive energy into energy that can help us grow. So there's a surprising twist. Melanin is a lot more important and a lot bigger in function than what anybody up to now has given it credit for. Melanin is a very important part of animal life on this planet. In our discussion on the nature of organelles in the cell, almost all the ones we talked about uh, such as mitochondria, or even the melanin granules of the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi bodies. These are all membranous structures in the cytoplasm uh, and given the name organelles because their function is the same as the organs in our body. But I also want to address the fact that there are some organelles that are very important that don't even have any membranes at all. One of them is a structure called a ribosome. When I say ribosome, what that really means, it's a molecule made out of RNA, ribonucleic acid, and protein. And ribosomes are particle-like structures, and their functions are very, very important because the function of the ribosome is to synthesize the protein. Well, to do that, you have to have a piece of nucleic acid come from the, the nucleus of the cell with a program in it, a gene. But the original gene doesn't come out of the nucleus. A copy of the gene comes out, but the copy is not DNA. It's a very similar molecule, but it's called RNA, ribonucleic acid. So the RNA, some of that RNA are what are called messenger RNA. They're the messages of the genes translated from DNA to RNA. But now that this message comes out and it's like a, a linear piece of information, it's like a, a poppet bead uh, structure with with different uh, nucleic acid bases uh, representing a code, a genetic code. So it's like a ribbon with a genetic code. But if you want to make a protein out of it, you have to have a mechanism read the ribbon and assemble the amino acids that make the protein in the right sequence. Uh, to do that, this is the function of what is called a ribosome. Some means body. Ribo is RNA or nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid structure. So uh, a ribosome has uh, 
RNA structure, but it also has proteins in it to make a little machine. It's a reader. And the ribosome takes the code from the messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA is a string with a code, goes into the ribosome on one side. And as the string moves through the ribosome, a new protein is created from the ribosome coming up out of the top. So the messenger RNA is what? Coming from the outside, connects to ribosome, no membrane, just RNA and proteins. The nucleic acid goes in one end of the ribosome and comes out the other end. But while it's going through the ribosome, the ribosome assembles the protein by creating a peptide come out of the ribosome at the other side. So basically it says this, a ribosome is a miniature organelle, doesn't have any membranes, but it's a particle structure whose job it is is to read a genetic code in the form of RNA, ribonucleic acid, translate that genetic code into a protein, which is a string of amino acids. So the code for assembling the protein is in the RNA, and as it goes through the ribosome, the code is read by the ribosome, which adds one amino acid after another amino acid after another as the, as the message is going through, and the sequence of amino acids is called a protein. So a ribosome is a reader of nucleic acid information and translate that uh, information into the creation of a protein. So ribosomes are organelles, but that's an example of an organelle that doesn't have any membrane at all. So there are membranous organelles, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, nucleus, mitochondria, and there are also uh, organelles with no membrane, such as the ribosome, or structures that have the skeleton of the cell, uh, which are not membranous, but are filaments and fibers, such as actin and myosin and intermediate filaments and microtubules. These are skeletal structures with no membrane. And the ribosome is similar to that because it's a structure used to read genetic information and translate it into proteins and has no membrane in it. Now, when you say the word ribosome, it also comes very close to another word, and people get confused between this ribosome word and the other word, which is ribozyme. Ribosome means a particle. Some is body. A, a ribosome is an RNA-containing particle or body. Ribozyme, the zyme part, means like enzyme. It's a protein that carries out uh, a synthesis function. And I say, well, why is this protein different? Why is it called a ribozyme instead of an enzyme? Well, enzymes are proteins. But ribozyme is a molecule that's made out of RNA, nucleic acid, and some proteins together. Uh, and th this particle called a ribozyme is an enzyme that can do metabolism and synthesize things. Uh, so basically... What's the difference between a ribosome and a ribozyme? A ribosome is a physical particle like a little machine that will translate nucleic acid messages and create proteins from the message. A ribozyme is a small particle, but it's an enzyme made out of nucleic acid. And the function of an enzyme is to synthesize things or to break things down. And in the history of biology, ribozymes seem to play an important role for a simple reason. In evolution, DNA was not here on the planet when the first life forms were present. Well, if DNA wasn't here, then what were, where, where was the uh, information, the memory? Where was that coming from? How did it work when there was no uh, DNA here? Well, the RNA was the messenger, so it was like the precursor to a gene, a DNA. So RNA is a precursor to DNA. But RNA... Uh, could also, instead of just being a message, be an enzyme and carry out functions. So when they said, in the most primitive cells, what created the functions that led to metabolism and the behavior of living organisms? They said, well, no nucleic acid was there except ribonucleic acid, not DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid was present, and it had two functions. It had a memory ability, but it also had ability to change shape. Changing shape produces movement. 
and therefore, uh, in an enzyme, for example, an enzyme must grab onto a molecule and change shape and break the molecule, that's digestion. Or an enzyme can grab two pieces of molecules, bring them together, and that would be called synthesis. So uh, digestion is the breakdown of molecule, synthesis is to build a molecule, but both of them take a structure that can move. Enzymes can do this in their proteins, but it also turns out ribozymes are like primitive proteins as well. So there are many scientists that believe that life started the action part of it from what are called ribozymes, enzymes that could create metabolism. So it's very important to recognize that in a cell there are ribozymes and there are ribosomes, but they're not the same thing. Ribozymes are the enzymes that carry out functions. Ribosomes are the little machines that are used to read nucleic acid messengers and create proteins. They're very, very different, and yet uh, they have very much almost the same sounding name. So it's really important to recognize that um, we are talking about very different things in the cytoplasm between the particles of ribosomes used for synthesis and the particles of ribozymes used for creating metabolism. Edgar, there's one important lesson we must learn from the history we've all been through and the history we've read about, and that is simply this. Fear is a great motivator. That if you can get people to live in fear, then you can sell them any damn thing that you want. And so basically, what the whole idea is, is when we run out of one fear that has been pushing people in one direction, the organizations, the industries that are behind all this media and behind selling us all their products and ideas will come up with another fear, no matter which one it is. Sometimes it's a fear of the environment we live in. We talk about the water is bad, the air is bad, and everybody starts getting nervous about that. Then we talk about the bacteria and the viruses that are bad and the flu that comes around every year. And then we start talking about, oh my God, the radiation from Japan is going to you know, kill us all. Every time we start to get a little calmed down, down, then we are faced with another new fear to take our minds off the immediacy of what's going on and in a moment of fear, very important as I describe in the lecture, that neural functions change in fear. Not only we change the chemistry of our body, but the stress hormones change the operation of the brain. That when we're in fear, the stress hormones squeeze the blood vessels shut in the forebrain, which is conscious reasoning and logic, thinking. And forces the blood, as a result of closing down the blood vessels in the front, forces the blood to the hindbrain, where we operate from reactive behavior, which is not thinking at all, it's just stimulus response. So the nature is, as we become more uh, engaged in fear, we become less intelligent, and at that moment more open to the resolutions provided by industry, who were selling the fear in the first place. So basically the issue is, I don't know what the exact next fear is. Maybe aliens are gonna be here. They're selling that one as well. Whatever you wanna talk about, they will find one, they will sell it, and the mass of the population will buy it. And as a result, they will be further disempowered and more power will be channeled in to the few that are making the decisions for the masses.